All right, so we're continuing our um, agenda for this morning, and Chris and I are gonna be presenting our next section. And as we transition to our next uh, presentation, I'd like to have everybody just stand up and stretch. It's always good to get a movement break. So please stand up, you know, do a little dance in your place, whatever makes you feel good, whatever helps you move. <laughs> it's always good to stretch, right? Yes. Body movement, yep. Oh, good, and we even have music to support you. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is part of the video. This is your role. This is part of the video. They're, they're good. They're just, uh. Yeah. <laughs> All right. They have music. <laughs> Everybody take a stretch. All right. So the next topic that we have to talk about today is about advocacy, uh, patient advocacy and self-advocacy. And so it's just an honor to be here to speak with you all today and to present this content. So we'll get started. Um, patient, advoca patient advocacy is a core value of many different medical training programs and also healthcare training programs. And so this topic is near and dear to our hearts as we move forward and talk about ways to be an amazing advocate for yourself and also an advocate for your loved ones. Um, patient advocacy includes recognizing and addressing social determinants of health, um, navigating complex health systems such as access to care and figuring out insurances and in appointments and making it to all of these myriad or different healthcare appointments that we all need to attend. Um, patient advocacy also includes recognizing patient uh, concerns and goals. And so when we think about advocacy, we think about as healthcare professionals, we need to be actively listening and considering and keeping the patient at the, uh, the center so that we can figure out patient's goals and next directions and steps in life. Patient advocacy also includes advocating for appropriate medical care and treatment. And so this might be working with doctors and physicians and healthcare professionals to figure out what the next steps are for, for our overall health and quality of life and well-being. And when I think about um, the fifth aspect of creating an exceptional therapeutic alliance and addressing mistrust, I think about the, the key and the role of being open communication. So talking with doctors and medical professionals to find out and communicate what are patient needs and um, next steps. And so social determinants of health, for example, they might include things like access to care, um, circling back to number one. Um, as a speech-language pathologist, I think about the importance of working with interpreters and making sure that it, interpreters are, are present at medical appointments for those individuals who are bilingual or multilingual or trilingual um, so that there can be appropriate access to care and patients have an understanding of everything that's going on within their health care plan and health care journey. Um, I also think about... Um, providing education as a healthcare professional, providing education around health literacy and having an understanding of where to access information and in what modality. Um, as a healthcare provider, I wanna make sure that information is easy for patients to access, it's accessible, and it's available when, when we all need it. And I also think of the importance of working as part of an interdisciplinary team and that being part of patient advocacy making sure that you each have a holistic team that can provide care in every area that you need. And so as a patient advocating on behalf of yourself, it's also important that you know who your team is and who's, uh, what the roles are of each of your healthcare team members so that you can have optimal holistic quality of life and patient care. So these are some of the things I think about about patient advocacy. Then we get into patient self-advocacy. And this is as a patient, um, you know, I'm, I'm a speech language pathologist by training, but I'm also at times a patient. And so I think about what can I do to make my healthcare as optimal as possible. So as a patient, I can self-advocate. 
I can make informed decisions about care. And Thomas and colleagues had a nice paper that was just published this year that kind of talked about patient self-advocacy and some steps that patients can take. So one of the first things that I like to do is I like to make informed decisions about my own care. So what am I going to do? Uh, the temptation is to get online and read as much as you can. But it's important that the online information that we're getting is accurate, is timely, and is appropriate. So I'm going to do some research and find some articles or some journals or reach out to physicians who can provide me with information that I need to make informed decision about my care. because. I'm the expert of me, and you're the expert of you. And we all know each ourselves the best. And so with that information, we can have optimal patient care. Secondly, I think about communicating effectively with healthcare providers. Um, I think about we only have a short window of time to speak with our doctor. Sometimes they'll ask a question, and that changes the nature of the appointment. So I go in, I'll take some notes so that I make sure that the information that I'm really seeking gets addressed and I don't forget to ask about X, Y, and Z. So communicating effectively with healthcare providers is an important component of patient self-advocacy. And then building strength through connection to others. Um, using digital media to advance goals. So connecting with each other on social media, Instagram, TikTok, we can all learn from each other and connect. Um, face group uh, organizations, national and local organizations are all things that we can access to maintain connection. And I just want to commend each and every one of you who are here today, either in the room or visiting online, that you're here and you're here to get information. And this is a form of self-advocacy. So I want to take a moment just to respect and commend you for that. So what are the consequences of poor patient self-advocacy? We know that poor symptom management is something we don't want to have happen. So we want to make sure that symptoms are managed and controlled and that you have the opt optimal quality of life. Um, low quality of life is another aspect of poor patient self-advocacy. And finally, a lack of patient-centered uh, patient care. So if you, um, if, you know, for example, if I forget what I wanted to ask the doctor when I show up, um, then that's a, you know, a missed opportunity for me to fix a situation in my life. And so I just want to kind of put a pin in that to remind us about those aspects. Okay, Accord according to Wickenfield and Thomas, there's different kinds of patient self-advocacy. Um, there's controlling self-advocacy and there's communicative self-advocacy. And so I would refer to that article for additional information, but I just wanted to kind of unpack a little bit about what's involved. So for controlling self-advocacy, it's really a patient self-advocating and being assertive about treatment decisions, being persistent about gathering information, and maintaining a relationship with everyone in your team. And I'm really, really focused on that maintenance of a relationship, especially with um, our culture being more current around just dismissing somebody if they you know, if we have a bad time, if we have bad experience, if we have a, a poor interaction with somebody, we just say, okay, I'm just going to write them off and I'm going to move on. But what is the opportunity that we have to lean in? Instead of um, stepping away, engaging with that relationship. Looking for the kernel of merit of that relationship and what that person can do to support us as part of their healthcare team. And working together to pull in the same direction. And I think a lot of um, concerns can be fixed with really great communication between a patient and a medical team, a team member. So assertiveness regarding treatment decisions, information gathering, and managing that relationship. I think about it um, as a speech pathologist in the schools. I think about what are opportunities we have to connect with the school to communicate clearly what we want to have happen for the education of our child with NF, or the opportunity that we have to connect with our school or our hospital? What if ha something happened and it wasn't really what we wanted? Is there a way that we can connect? OK, secondly, communicative self-advocacy. And this is patients' ability to convey symptom information and value information to providers. So this is 
really being clear about what are symptoms that we're experiencing or you're experiencing and making sure that the physicians or your medical team has a clear understanding of what's going on. Okay. Um, finally, there's patient self-advocacy. And I want to speak a little bit about the ability of a person to speak up in the face of a challenge. Sometimes things get really hard. And sometimes there's moments where we're like, I don't know what to do next. But in the face of a challenge, and I want to circle back to Conrad and Derek, we, it's an opportunity for learning and growth. So communicating in the face of a challenge. And patients can self-advocate by making informed decisions about care, building, again, communicative, uh, communicating effectively with healthcare providers, and building strength. OK. I backed up a little bit. OK. Um, finally, healthcare providers also play a critical role in this as well. And they can build self-advocacy for children by giving children the opportunity to make decisions. So an example um, that I found was, for example, if a physician would ask, you know, would you like a shot in your left leg or your right leg to a young child? Then they can have some personal autonomy and make a decision and engage. Um, and a second step is making an all about me card to help children to teach others about NF and about their experience. And that can be used to inform teachers and educators in the classroom. And parents and healthcare providers can also help draft communication to teachers through emails or letters to let them know about absences or miss, um, if they have to miss school for appointments, or even things that they need, um, such as if you're setting up an, IEP, an individualized educational plan or a 504 plan. And I'm really excited to speak to you more about this as we move throughout the summit, about educational supports and things that we can do. OK. There's a couple of resources for self-advocacy as well that I wanted to share with you. For example, at kidshealth.org, um, Nehmer's Kids Health has some information. And it's for parents and families to really gain additional information about um, how the body works, and there's information for kids about puberty and growing up, and there's also information about how kids can stay healthy. So there's resources online. Um, there's also the Talk a Doctor app at educationalappstore.com, and um, my disc I don't have disclosures. I'm not financially tied to any of these organizations. These are things that I recognize were, might be helpful to you all, and I found, I found these resources. Um, and so on um, the Talk Doctor app, there's the Orthopedic Patient Education app, and it has information for healthcare professionals to communicate about anatomy and conditions and um, treatments to patients. So that's another helpful app. And there's also something called the Invisible Ear, which is a 3D augmented reality app. And this has information about biological and medical investigation. And it's also got gross anatomy of the ear. So if you need something visual to provide more information to kids, um, this can be a way that they can use these materials and have that increased self-advocacy. And then finally, there's a Simply Saying Medical Jargon app. And this is available on iTunes and Google Play. And I really liked this one. Sorry, I keep going back. OK. I like this one because it's got a lot of visuals in it as well. So if you have a child who is about to have a certain procedure, there's information about various procedures. And so I like this one, for example, it's got information about a barium swallow study. So if a child has problems with swallowing or feeding, and we need to do additional evaluation to look at the mechanism for feeding or swallowing, there's information on this app about the procedure. There's pictures and photography about what's involved. And then there's also a draw paint portion, so kids can actually look at anatomy and interact with it prior to the day. So it's just a little bit more hands-on. It gives children that experience and ability to know what's coming so that they can be an optimal patient self-advocate. OK, thank you. All right. Can you this? Thank you, Chris. I'm going to get a little more specific now. Um, advocacy and research. And first of all, I want you to see this map, this map that is densely Eastern, the NF uh, uh, clinics that are part of the CTF clinical consortium here in the United States. And uh, I think we're kind of on the Eastern edge in Minnesota, but you see in the middle of the country, there's huge voids and we recognize that there's a lot of people 
who have a lot of access issues getting to clinics with expertise. Um, so anyway, the, the, uh, the CTFNF clinics are really important for those who have access to them. Use them. Encourage your friends with NF to use them. If you're on NF Moms Rock, right, Marion? Then you, you should be able to use that and, um, and go in and demand uh, the excellence that's at those clinics. Research participation is a form of, of advocacy. We're not going to improve care for those with NF2 schwannomatosis, schwannomatosis, or NF1 without research. And research isn't just test tubes. Research isn't having blood drawn all the time. We've done research with epidemiologists looking at the impact of socioeconomic factors and racial factors uh, as they relate to outcomes of treating different things related to NF. We've done research um, with neuropsychologists looking at learning and socialization. And of course, we've done a number of clinical trials with the new medicines that are available to us right now. There are multiple avenues to move the field forward as a patient or as a family member of those with NF and related um, conditions. The Neurofibromatosis Consortium, or Clinical Trials Consortium, is currently conduct conducting clinical, clinical trials for NF1, NF2, and schwannomatosis right now. The, there are clinical trials out there right now that you can participate in. In addition um, to clinical trials, there's tons of basic research going on. CTF, sponsoring this, uh, this summit, has also um, sponsored programs called Synodos programs. And those Synodos programs bring together scientists from multiple institutions to focus on one problem. At the University of Minnesota, we're part of a Synodos project focusing on malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. And together with scientists at other, at other institutions, we've really honed in on new treatments that'll make big outcome differences for people suffering with that tumor in the context of NF1. And of course, our, one of them is our sponsor here today, Alexion, but there are multiple um, industry-sponsored trials going on right now that may or already have led to major breakthroughs for the care of people with NF1. And Flexion Therapeutics, uh, some of you may have um, participated in their clinical trials. It's a topical treatment for skin involvement in NF. Springworks Therapeutics has a new uh, MEK inhibitor that they're using in adults and children with NF. And Recursion Pharmaceuticals is testing a new drug to treat meningiomas in people with NF2 schwannomatosis. Um, so although there are a lot of clinical trials that are happening in academic centers, the industry-sponsored trials have been very important to moving this field forward also. So I'm going to tell you a story about how CTF and industry work together to develop the drug that many of you in this room are familiar with, Caselugo. AstraZeneca, way back when, had a drug, and I, and I was one of about 30 people sitting at a table for a new consortium that, that CTF developed, gosh, it's probably nearly 20 years ago now, called the Drug Development Initiative. And as we sat around that table and looked at different drugs, we saw this drug from AstraZeneca, AZD6244. It identified, we identified this drug as something of promise for people with NF1 plexiform neurofibromas. Multiple scientists did the lab work to show that the drug would indeed translate to patients. And the National Cancer Institute led clinical trials to treat children with NF1-associated plexiform neurofibroma. They proved that the drug was safe and effective. 
And that led to two major studies published in the New England Journal of Medicine and ultimately FDA approval of Caselugo for the treatment of children with plexiform neurofibroma. It's, it's really an amazing story about how CTF, this organization, came together with industry, science, and clinicians to bring a drug forward that's made a huge difference in the lives of many, many people with NF1. The NF registry, you're going to talk about that too. So I'm just introducing the NF registry. Um, and uh, I guess I'll leave it to Heather to tell you about some of the challenges with the NF registry. But this is another wonderful opportunity for you guys to all participate directly. And you can reach the NF registry through the CTF website. You can reach the NF registry through your clinics. Please, 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 if you're not part of the registry now, please consider it today. And Heather, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. That sounds great, thank you. All right. Um, so the NF registry uh, does have the opportunity to also engage and provide information to researchers. And so I think that that's really important. Um, for example, when I was using the NF registry, it was in collaboration with Kimberly Mars, and I'm not sure if Kimberly's here today. Hi, Kimberly. Yep, Kimberly's here. Um, so Kimberly Mars and I had the chance to do a project where we developed a patient-reported outcomes tool to look at communication concerns in individuals with NF. And as part of the development of the tool, we really sought out, or Kimberly really sought out, um, information from patient representatives, um, both through RAINS, which I'll talk about in a few moments, but also received information through the patient registry. And many individuals who were part of the patient registry, if you completed our survey a little bit ago, I just want to say thank you so much for doing so, because it's really helped to drive the research forward. Um, one of the challenges with the registry is, of course, the majority of the registry is composed of women and uh, female children. And we definitely want to encourage and invite individuals from a variety of backgrounds because we need a, a more diverse registry. I mean, I think about diversity, and we all have diversity within us, right? We all come with the different experiences and different backgrounds and different perspectives. We all come from different locations around the United States and internationally. And so we definitely want to increase the diversity of the registry to gain different perspectives. And then the registry um, participants can engage with different research, provide information to help make um, outcome, clinical trials outcomes more relevant, more feasible, more accessible, and hopefully, in a, eventually, um, available in a multitude of languages so that individuals with NF all around the world can participate in clinical research. And so um, as a speech language pathologist, I'm really interested in making sure that we have um, accessibility involved and embedded as part of our work. And so hearing from all of you and from the NF registrants, it really helps us to develop more um, accessible and timely and appropriate measures. Um, so I'll turn it back to you to talk about the skin project. Sure. Um, I, um, Heather didn't say it specifically. We need more guys <laughs> on the registry, OK? Um, that has mu as much to do with diversity as anything. Absolutely. <laughs> so um, Heather and I are part of the responsive uh, evaluation in neurofibromatosis and schwannomatosis group, RAINS. Um, it's an international effort with the mission of developing new standardized response criteria for determining treatment response in NF1, NF2, and schwannomatosis. There are nine different working groups. I'm part of the skin group. You're part of the? I'm part of the patient reported outcomes working group, uh, the functional working group, and the neurocognitive group. So there's look, lots of different groups. Yeah, look at her. I, I'm too lazy, so I, no. I just focused on one. Anyway, so uh, we work to identify outcomes so that when we conduct clinical trials, we pay attention to the right thing. And guess what? Every working group as a patient advocate as part of that working group. So we as scientists don't end up off in la-la land. We're always brought back to ground 
by our patients and our families saying, no, 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 this is what we want you to focus on. And so patient reported outcomes, functional outcomes, imaging, visual outcomes, neurocognitive outcomes, disease biomarkers, um, measuring cutaneous neurofibromas in the right way, um, and figuring out how the heck we're going to evaluate gene therapy are all part of what we're doing. We're, we've already published one paper on measuring skin outcomes. We're about to publish a new one that's all based on what we've learned from patients in Europe and America. And, and so then from here, I can talk a little bit about the Patient Reported Outcomes Working Group. Um, so over the past, we've done a number of different projects under the leadership of Pam Walters. And she helped, um, she really led the working group um, through to several different publications that looked at pain intensity and pain interference. And then later on did publications that looked at um, patient reported quality of life that was both generic quality of life, but also uh, looked at measures that were for disease specific or condition specific quality of life, so NF1 and NF2, um, NF2 related schwannomatosis. And so we had the chance to engage with patient representatives as part of that patient reported outcomes working group. And um, the work that came out of that was the group had evaluated all these different measures that looked at pain intensity, pain interference that have been published, and then made recommendations over which measure was, was ultimately best for patients. But as you can see, if it's a bunch of clinicians and researchers in the room, and clinicians and researchers are making decisions about these various outcomes for clinical trials, we really need a patient representative voice in, you know, is this measure feasible? Is it something that's um, doable by patients and families in the context of everyday lives? Like, or is the measure too long or too cumbersome to complete? Um, we also want to make sure that measures that we pick are available in multiple languages and that are appropriate um, for patients and families that we serve. And so as part of clinical trials endpoints, this discussion of having individuals with NF, NF2, related schwannomatosis and schwannomatosis, it's really important that everybody's involved and gives that opportunity for feedback. Um, around the functional outcomes working group, I know that the current direction is working on bone. And so I encourage anyone who's interested to reach out to Vanessa Merker. She's head of the patient Re representation committee of, um, the, of RAINS and get more information about uh, if you're interested in becoming involved. Okay, so for patient representation, um, you know, we have a, a several different individuals who come together on regular conference calls and the patient representation work is conducted through Zoom. So it's, you can sit in the comfort of your own home and participate on calls. Sometimes the calls are at various times of day. And so it's just a matter of kind of scheduling when people are available to participate. Um, but it's a really kind and caring group of people, um, and I've had the chance to bring work to the patient representation working group to get feedback from people involved. And so for those of you who are on this working group, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for your participation, and your input is invaluable, and we couldn't do it without you, so thank you. Okay, so in 2013, there were six RAINS publications that came out, and they were published in Neurology. And so these are the titles there. Um, it's connected to the Children's Tumor Foundation website. If you click on the button that says RAINS, it can take you to more information. You can read the publications if you like. They're all available and linked. Um, RAINS also has its own website as well with information about current, uh, not current, current events, but also current activities and working group work. And um, Later on in 2016, there were two, in supplement two, there were seven papers. Um, and then supplement three included 13 papers. So there's a lot more work going on, and some of the groups have divided into you know, subgroups and published work as well. Um, and it's just such an honor and a privilege to have the chance to engage with patient representatives and do this, do this great work. So um, and thanks to Brigitte Wiedemann and Scott Plotkin. Um, who are leading reins. All right, we'll turn it over to Synodos and CTF. Yep.
So how does this all get paid for? First of all, I want to underline uh, the announcement that Annette made earlier today. It's a congressionally mandated program she talked about that led to the $25 million outlay of money for NF. When I say congressionally mandated, I'm saying your representatives in Congress. That means each of you has a voice with your representatives to move this forward, and your senators, of course. So use your voice politically. I, oh, this was supposed to be a political free zone. But uh, use your voice with your representatives um, in a non-political way. Advocacy to, is apolitical. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> to support <laughs> NF. Yeah, it'll be one of the things that will be truly apolitical, but please do it. And, and when we look at those, those forms of support, uh, NF isn't the only thing that's benefiting from that. There's other rare diseases, and uh, brain tumors specifically, for those of you who have interfaced with people dealing with brain tumors or have an interest in brain tumor research, there's a whole separate category for brain tumor research in adults and children. Um, Cididose is funded through the Children's Tumor Foundation, so increasing funding and optimizing funding for the Children's Tumor Foundation optimizes funding for the Cinidos programs. Um, and I really, really do believe it's money well spent. The Young Investigator Initiative through CTF, YIA, brings in young people who are new in science and clinical investigation who can apply to be young investigators and be funded through CTF. And we have a number of scientists out there in well-established labs who were young investigators once upon a time. And so CTF has made a huge impact on overall research that impacts you uh, through that program. And then finally, clinical trials. Not all clinical trials are supported by huge money from Congress, big money from CTF, or big money from industry. There are many clinical trials that are investigator-initiated trials within the institutions you visit. Um, so I, I right now am leading two investigator-initiated trials with minimal funding from outside. And so paying attention to what's going on in your clinic, at, in the labs, at your homes, um, and paying attention to how they can be supported is super, super important. All right, are you so, ready? Yeah, absolutely. So now, um, now we get into some activities. So this is gonna be a little bit different than your traditional conference presentation where we stand up here like talking heads. Um, we'd love to hear your input and have you all get involved. So we've got a little activity for you. So at this point, um, what I'd like you to do is get in some small groups, uh, maybe five to six people. Kind of just turn to the people around you or move closer um, if you can. And what we're gonna do is have a number of different discussion questions. And we're gonna raise the house lights, turn on a little bit of soft music, and you'll have the chance to talk to each other about our activity. Okay, so first question is about interest areas. We want you to develop some interest areas and learn more about ways that you can become a patient self-advocate or a patient advocate or an advocate. Um, what are some interests that you have and where would you like to get involved? So what we'll have you do is talk for about five minutes, then I'll call like a one minute, call us back together, and then it'll be an opportunity to hear from you. So maybe nominate somebody in your group to be a, a talker, and we'll turn it back and we'll come and visit you with the microphones at the end, okay? All right, so five minutes of discussion in your groups. We'll come around and then we'll, we'll do some coming back together to talk about it, and go.
gentlemen. So we have one minute, one minute warning to finish up conversations and then we'll come back together. everybody so we'll come back together thank you so much for your group discussion and some collaboration I can feel the communicative self-advocacy happening right now <laughs> all right so what we're gonna do is now circle back to the groups and hear from all of you and we've got some folks with microphones in the audience and so we'd love to hear what are some interests that you have and where would you like to get involved and so we'll start and Kim, you're back there. Is somebody back there with a microphone? All right, perfect. Okay, so can we hear from one group? Mercedes. So one form of self-advocacy that you can use is social media. It's really important. Um, I use TikTok, Facebook a little bit more so on TikTok. I've reached 78.3 thousand people on TikTok. Some of you are here in this room. So some of you are in this room and have followed me and I love it and I love answering questions. And yes, I get the bullies, but then I educate them with kindness like Fred Rogers would. Because if Fred Rogers doesn't say it, you don't say it. Plain and simple. But talk about it with people. Ask, I, my mom made me business cards because my mom, my mom is my biggest supporter. But, you know, find a niche. Find your niche, my niche is, you know, dealing with the bullies and educating them kindly. I talked, when I've talked to my doctors, I've given them the new CTF app for the patients and for, for the doctors. So that way they can find the most current, the most up-to-date information. And you, you, that's something you need to do. Make sure your doctors have that. Yeah. And if they don't, fire them. If they're not gonna listen to them, <laughs> fire them. Because they work for you, you don't work for them. Thank you so much, Mercedes. Excellent. All right, I'll pose it to the group again. So what are some interests that you have and where would you like to get involved? Can I have someone else volunteer? We see a hand up here. And just tell us your name as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Jalen. Um, I'm from Ohio. Um, one thing about the advocacy that I have done was I emailed some of my representatives and where I'm from downtown they have like a lot of buildings that light up like the Empire State Building I contacted the light company and the owner of those buildings to see if they could do the blue and green fortunately nobody answered um, but my question also with the um, self-advocacy of contacting the representatives and people in your um, government in the state house what can you do to break the barrier of if, when people don't answer because i know in cincinnati they have walks and everything but they don't have anything in columbus at all for nf but i've been trying and everything so i do post stuff on social media um i've contacted um some people but what do we do if no one answers yeah that's a great question um if what if no one answers if she has asked to have the blue and green lights. We have some experienced people with that in the room. Does anybody have an idea? Yeah. Period. Yep. Thank you. Absolutely. So she said, just keep bothering them. Put it on social media. I like, I always think about, have you watched Big Bang Theory where... Yeah. <laughs> 
Sheldon is like, Penny, Penny, Penny. <laughs> <laughs> but I there is strength in numbers, too. So the more people you can get to make the same contact you've made, it's important. And then community leaders, especially business leaders, have been really valuable for us. So if you can make any kind of contact with the company you work at or anything like that, it's, that, that works out very, very well. Right, that's right. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Let's do one more, and then let's hear from one more person. Yep, yourself. Thank you, and just tell us your name. Hi, I'm Shannon. I'm from Idaho as well, just like Mercedes. Um, the fabulous doctor who had to leave, who was sitting with us, mentioned that to be a good self-advocate with the doctors, go to the doctors with lists of questions that you're willing to ask. Do not expect them to sit there and go through all of your questions when you don't have it ready and prepared because they're very busy. And so he's made it a really good point. If you're ready and prepared with a list, it makes it super quick for the appointments, and then you can get the answers you want. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that feedback. Go with the list. If, if I may, I'm just going to add to that quickly. For those of you uh, with hearing or communication issues, well, I guess in my clinic, I, I encourage people to communicate with me either through my chart, if you guys are in one of those clinics, yeah. or through um, email. Mm -hmm. Email, we always have to say, is not a secured form of communication. But if you initiate that communication, then we can answer. And email or my chart are great because if you communicate through a list, then we can answer through a list and, and you can keep things really well organized. Yeah. I, I have a number of uh, patients who are, are themselves or their parents are contractors who come with their big books or engineers who come equipped with a spreadsheet and an algorithm, and those are my favorite <laughs> families. Wait a minute, wait for the microphone. I went to my doctor with several concerns that I was having, and he says, oh, Linda, you just have a grocery list of complaints, and he is no longer my doctor. Yes, way to go. Um, so, at this point, we'd like to move to our second question, or activity, and this is additional brainstorming, ways to be an advocate. So, I know that there's a lot of text here, so let's kind of talk about it. So, how can, you be, how can you be involved as an advocate? So, I have a number of different things that, to think about, and in the interest of time, we've got about 11 minutes, which is great, because that gives us time to do this. But you can also respond to this through the Whova app because we put four of these items up as poll items. So if we don't have time to hear from everybody today, you can also engage with the app. Um, so one of them, one of the questions I have is, how can you help to recognize and address social determinants of health? And so when I think about social determinants, I think of how can we help someone else become connected with, say, an NF center? Um, how can you help with helping to navigate a complex health system? So is there something that you can do to advocate for an easier connection? Or how can you help to address patient concerns and goals? So could you help someone else to identify their goals, talk to a friend, help them figure out what's really bothering them, and then so that they have an easier time communicating that to their healthcare team? Okay, so let's spend five more minutes in your small groups talking and brainstorming ways that you can be an advocate, and then we'll come back together and do the same thing. Okay. And this time I won't leave.
this is your one minute warning. Uh, one minute before we come back together and do whole group discussion. everyone so we're going to come back together now and um, participate in our whole group discussion and wrap up our session here and so I think Stephen's going to start us off so the question is um, how can you be involved and how can you be a, an advocate well in terms of being an advocate there's different ways to go about it First, learning to advocate for yourself in receiving your own care and communicating effectively with your care team because I am blessed with the opportunity to have learned about multiple medical conditions and have to work with very many ologists. I have lots of ologists in my life. <laughs> and so something I learned to do was to set a written agenda that I take to every single appointment I take two copies, one for myself, one for the doctor. There's, a, there's an example up there. And the agenda always starts with treatment goals. And I make sure my provider knows what it is I want out of treatment. Yeah. And it's also, it's a segue into what am I not willing to tolerate in terms of adverse effects from treatment. It's important. Those adverse effects are real. Absolutely. Yeah. And adverse effects lead to treatment failure. And so I make sure my providers know that. And then I also talk with them about my treatment approaches. What are the things that are my preferences for how I approach treatment? So I want to see the evidence. I want you to tell me about the science behind what you're recommending to me. By the way, I'm willing to consider using complementary health approaches, and I'm actively using them now. And making sure that my providers know what it is I want to do in terms of how I'm going to approach treatment. And then I have a, a section here. It's, it's what I call updates, issues, and questions. So I insist on holistic care. And if I'm talking to a specialist, I still want that specialist to know what's going on in the rest of my body because your body is a whole integrated system. So I yeah. make sure they're aware of what's going on and then I go through and I make a list, and this, here's the questions I have for you. That's today. excellent. That's excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Another person, I see your hand up down here. And tell us your name as well. Oh. My name is Jennifer, and I don't actually have enough. I'm here supporting my friend. But I just wanted to know I seen your map, and there was five or six states that didn't have any help. So I was wondering, how come the states that are clustered, how come some of those can't branch out to the states that have nothing? That's a great question. 
And I think that continually there's more NF centers that are growing and starting. Um, we need experts who live in those areas to either relocate to those areas or to start NF centers and understand uh, a multidisciplinary whole team approach is um, you know, a great objective and, and goal to strive for. Um, so thank you for drawing our awareness to that and you know, the work that we do. Chris, do you want to add? Where, where are you from? I'm from Wyoming and my friend oh. is from Wyoming. Yeah. Great, and my great. other friends are from Idaho and Washington and you great. know, there's just no uh, yeah. where for my us My family's to go. from Buffalo, Wyoming. So, hi. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so Minnesota, where I'm from, is obviously a rural state and we're surrounded by North and South Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin, and we can go out farther. We end up with, with some patients from Montana and from Nebraska. So our, we consider our job to be as collaborative as possible. Um, number one, if people need access to clinical trials or simply to expertise, or maybe to someone who can pronounce neurofibromatosis. Right. Um, we, we do our best to collaborate with home clinics to do that. Right. And, and Colorado, near you, has a very good comprehensive NF clinic too, where, and, and I know that they're very willing to collaborate and, and help out with uh, physicians back home. So it's what just, you need to do first- It's hard for my friends to get I seen there was a little dot, I think, in Utah as well. Yep, there's but a dot in Utah, too. it's hard for everybody yep. to get there. There just needs to be more. There's a dot in Utah, isn't there? There's a dot in Utah. Yeah. <laughs> there needs to be more yeah. branching out. Yeah, yeah, so my number one, find, if, if, if people in the room don't have a primary care physician, get going on that. Find <laughs> somebody who can be your primary care point, and number two, work with that primary care physician to make sure that you get what you need mm -hmm. from the expertise near you. We collaborate with primary care people all over, hundreds of miles away from us, to make sure that that primary care physician understands what's happening and understands what's available to those patients so that we can make their lives better. I think, so. I think people just need to get brave and relocate to help these people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'd like to also, Nikki is here, is it Nikki? Yes, so she's from Utah. So Nikki, Nikki, raise your hand again. So there's a connection right there. At least that's, it's not quite as close as we'd like, but the step forward, so. Okay, and this one more right we've here. got, yep, yeah, one more minute, and then we're going to wrap up our session. How I advocate at, <clears throat> at my school, or just in general, which I do at school. Um, for my iPad screensaver, I have a NF poster that I made myself using like editing software, talk like, about NF, and it has a little thing saying, want to know more about NF, ask me. And I also went up on a microphone at school and I talked about NF1, NF2, and I explained how it feels to have it, and how it is, and how rare it is. But I think I'm the only one in my school of NF, but that's why I introduced it to my school, so they can learn about it. I think that's really important, that's awesome. thank you. And sorry, and what is, sorry, what's your name? Oh, what's your name again? Avery. Avery, thank you. Avery, thank you for everything that you're doing in your school. I think everybody who goes to school with you now is more informed about NF, and that's outstanding. Thank you. Yeah, keep doing that. Excellent. All right, so this is time. Thank you, everyone, for your participation today. Um, it's been an honor to have this opportunity to talk about advocacy with you. And Chris, any final words? No, none. You've been a great audience, and it's really a privilege to be here with all of you. Thank so you. thanks a lot for letting us stand up here. <laughs> Thank you.